Father, thank you once again for another opportunity to dig into your word. I thank you, Lord, for every opportunity I have to share your word with whomsoever will. Lord, I ask that you use my vocal cords as you speak through me, Lord, and you deliver a word for your people in due season that will edify, that will instruct, that will encourage. I give you praise, honor, and glory for your faithfulness and your loving kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, before I give the title of the message, I want to do a lead-in first, okay? Now, how many of you heard the concept of identity theft? Right. right. Now, this is a kind of a crime that has become more and more of a threat as we, as a society, become more and more reliant on the internet, computers, on cell phones, and all these things. Because we use our phones, on the internet, all these things to pay, pay our bills, schedule doctor's appointments. Even now, we, we order groceries on our cell phone. Now, as a means of solving this problem, right, many, many companies, what they've done is that they provide software services to help protect from the threat of hackers, right? Because those are the folks that's trying to get your information. Now, everybody from Apple to Google to Cox, Verizon, have some form of virus or information monitoring services connected to their product. Why? To help you, the consumer, develop a sense of security using the product. Now, in spite of how good companies like LifeLock, Norton, or ID Shield are at keeping watch over your identity online, the most important defense against identity theft is to be cautious about the websites you visit and the emails you open, right? That's the first line of defense. Now, the more familiar you become with the websites, the emails that you receive from the people that you are in interaction with, the more familiar you are with the places that you go, with the formatting of the company's website, the design of it, the people you deal with, the better you will be able to recognize a phony website or a company that's trying to steal your information because you are so familiar with what is authentic. Now keep that in mind. Now, if you are a follower of Christ, guess what? You too have an enemy that has been trying to steal your identity in order to use your authority to make unauthorized transactions in your name. So in other words, the enemy wants to use your authority as a believer to fulfill his will and purpose instead of God's. So just like our computers have antivirus antivirus software, we as believers have the gift of the Holy Spirit abiding on the inside of us to shield us from all unauthorized communication. Now, so my, what is my goal tonight? My goal is to present you with three keys to help us to work through, to work together, to put us in a position to work together with the Holy Spirit to protect us from being victims of spiritual identity theft. So the title of the message is Spiritual Identity Theft Protection. Keys to protect yourself from spiritual identity theft. So let's start with key number one. Key number one. Know your worth. Know your worth. So let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And we'll start in verse 44. And I'll be coming from the New Living Translation. That's Matthew 13, starting verse 44. In the New Living Translation, it reads, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. 
again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. So it has been said that the value of an object is not so much determined by the object itself, but the value of an object is determined by the value that someone else places on it. So think about it. Think about baseball cards, football cards, basketball cards, name brand sneakers, cell phones, t-shirts. Now, if you look at all of these things, they're relatively cheap products to make, but their value is not determined by the raw materials that it takes to make the product, but the value that someone places on the product as a whole, that's what determines the value. Think about it. I can take plain t-shirt, fruit alone, two, three, four dollars, right, in Walmart. Now, if I put Michael Kors or Gucci, Ralph Lauren on the shirt, the shirt just went up like a hundred dollars or more. Why? Because of the name, right? And people place value in the name. Okay, but again, the raw materials used to make this the T-shirt is pretty much the same. But there are people who are willing to pay $150, $200 for a shirt that say Gucci on. Now, think about us as people. Adam, right, in his physical body, he was formed out of dust, the dust of the ground. Yet, after God blew the breath of life into him, he became a living soul made in the image of God after the likeness of God. But it came out of dirt. How much value do we have for dirt? Not much, right? But So we pretty much made the same raw materials. But guess what? There's something significant about us. There's something different about us. And when he blew the breath of life into Adam. He became a living soul. Now, remember the statement that I made earlier. The value of an object is not so much determined by the object itself, but the value of the object is determined by the value that someone else places on it. Now, what I want to do real quick, take a detour. I want us to go to Genesis chapter 1. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the very first act of spiritual identity theft in history. So we're going to start at Genesis 1, 26. In the New King James Version, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So after God created man, it was only a short time afterward where we see the very first act of spiritual identity that was committed by way of the serpent in Genesis 3. So let's go ahead. Genesis 3. I'm going to start at verse 1. And it reads, Now the serpent was, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You would not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat, 
eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now you see verses 4 and 5. The serpent questioned God's word, right? That's what he did. He made it seem as if God was holding out on her, right? But you just read it in verse 26. God himself saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So Adam was all Adam and Eve were already made in the image, the very image of God, the very likeness of God. This is what their true identity already was, because that's what God said. But what did this, what did the serpent do? So doubt, deception. First of all, he questioned the integrity of God's word and said, you shall not surely die. Right. And then he says, for God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But we see in verse 26, they were already in the image and likeness of God. They were created that. So what the enemy did is bring the deception in in order to create a wedge between man and God. This is what's happening. So he lied about their true identity, who they truly were, because they already were made in the image and likeness of God. Now, as you as you know. After it, Adam ate the fruit, they both found out their eyes were open. Their eyes were open to the natural carnal world at that point, so they could see their physical nakedness. So they were disconnected from the spiritual sight, which they already had because they were made in the image and likeness of God. Verse 26, chapter 1. Now, with all that being said, let's go back to Matthew 14 and 44. So, because we see that this is where sin entered in mankind, and the separation was started at that moment. Now, some people read Matthew 13, 44, and 46, and they, they interpret it as us being the one who is supposed to give our all for the kingdom of God, for to, for to the work of God, right? Now, obviously, God desires that type of devotion from his people, but that's not the true intent. That's not what this verse is saying. The merchant who is making the purchase is our father. Let's read it again. Verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Verse 45, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great price, he sold everything he owned and bought it. When God gave his son, he sold everything he had 
He gave of his best. He gave himself for us. That's why we can see what, and, and even in the part that we, we, we were tempted to miss is that not only did God give his son to pay the price for our sins to open up the door for reconciliation, but then he also gave his very spirit to man, to those who would receive him. So he paid the price of man's sin debt. And then he deposited his very spirit into all those who believe to dwell with for all times. So, you believer, you are that pearl of great price. And anyone who is not yet made that step to know the Lord, remember, look, God has given his best to extend his hand to you. The question is, will you take it? Will you take his hand? Realizing where you were. Realizing where you are. And your need for him. Because I know I need him. Every day. Every single day. I need him for my eternity and I need him for the next second. But he has offered himself to all who will receive him. So you are the pearl of great price. So key number one to knowing, to protecting yourself from spiritual identity theft is to know your worth, know your value. So let's go to key number two. Key number two is to know your purpose. Know your purpose. So let's go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. And I'm going to start at verse 13. And I'm going to stand in the New Living Translation. Matthew 5, starting at verse 13. And it says, You are the salt of the earth. Well, what good is salt if it, if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot. It's worthless. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. So you are called salt and light. Salt and light. So let's talk about a little bit. Just spend a little time talking about salt. Okay. So why did Jesus use this phrase, salt? All right. Now, salt is definitely, it's important to us now in, in the world we live now, but it was even more important back then before the technology of refrigeration. All right. Because salt, what it did was preserve things. Salt was a preservative. So they couldn't just go to the Frigidaire when they, you know, they cut up meat. So what would they do? They would pack it in salt. They would pack it in salt and, and to keep it from spoiling, from rot. Right? Now all of us know also, what else does salt do? It preserves and it adds flavor. How many of you have had some collard greens that didn't have no type of salt seasoning on it at all? And, you know, this is gonna taste too, it don't taste like much nothing. Alright. Potatoes, cabbage, all that type of stuff. What does that salt do? That salt draws that flavor out. So I can enjoy I can enjoy the fullness of what's in that potato, the cabbage, the collard greens, the string beans, all that type of stuff. Right? 
and draws out the flavor. I would dare to say, Jesus would say the same thing about you. You are in place in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, at your workplace, as a preservative. To add flavor to that workplace. To be a preservative. Think about it. What would the community be, your household be, the neighborhood be, if there weren't anyone allowing their light to shine? Allowing their, their saltiness to preserve their environment. And I, and I would dare to say that more and more of our communities would need more salt to get out the salt shake to get to touch our workplaces and our communities because we our communities need it. The, the, the preservative property of you as a believer to share the love of God, to share the gospel message, to pray and intercede for your neighbors, your co-workers. The world needs your salt, your saltiness more than ever. The world needs you to shine your light more than ever. So knowing your purpose, that not only that you have value to the Lord just because of who He is and who He is in, in His very nature. He values you, but He also wants to use you for His purposes. And knowing this will protect us from getting deceived and becoming consumers and gatherers. Because that's what that the natural world desires for us to do. To go, become consumers, gatherers. People that just consume together. Because think about it, because if we don't have a relationship with God, you don't, what's the purpose? You have so many folks that are looking for purpose. Looking for meaning in life. And out there the same. One of those reasons is why is not is that they don't know the value, but they also don't know the purpose. The purpose to be fruitful, to bear fruit in His name. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm gonna read it. Genesis one and twenty eight. God said, "Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over the sea, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground." So God called man to be fruitful from the beginning. He called man to be fruitful and to multiply. So that call to be fruitful is for every one of us. That command did not expire. And we can't find true fulfillment until we bear fruit. last key I want to identify here. The last key to protecting ourselves from spiritual identity theft is to know your refuge. To know your refuge. Right. Now refuge is a, is a, it's an antiquated word. We don't use that. You know, you, you, know, you don't say to your family, your, your spouse, yeah, I'm going to go to my refuge today. I'm about to go, go yeah, I'm going to the refuge. You know? But in biblical times, the word refuge was used as a shelter, to mean shelter or fortified place of protection. Okay. Now, we talked about the whole problem of identity theft, right? And everybody's trying to sell you on how their software and their company is the best at protecting your privacy, your information. Right? I dare to say that there's no protective security system better than God. The Holy Spirit and his angelic host. I dare to say that his is top notch and can't be beat. Alright. So where we're gonna go 
is Psalm 91. Very familiar set of scripture. And what I want to do, I want to read the whole thing. We're going to go down. Psalm 91, I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read this thing. You can't Okay. Starting at verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him I will trust. All right, let's stop right here. So the declaration is given. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Sounds like a pretty safe place, right? Okay. Now looking at verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. So we see here the psalmist is making a declaration. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. There are a lot of things that are, that are trying to grab our trust, but The Lord says he is our refuge. He is our first place of peace and protection. We are the one, we are to go to him first. And it's curious the way it starts in verse 2. I will say of the Lord. So God's protection system is voice activated. I will say of the Lord. He is our refuge and my fortress. Because what that, us making that declaration, me saying that in my prayer time, and as I just go about my day, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm releasing what God's de desired will already is. He desires to keep his children safe. That's what he wants. So if I'm verbalizing it, all I'm doing is, is agreeing with what he's already seen. Let's look at verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Deliverance from the fowler and the perilous pestilence. And that's encouragement right now. Because I know all of you are familiar with who watch the news anytime. Recently, you hear a lot about the coronavirus and flu and all this type of stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's all of these types of things that are out here and, and people are suffering and dying. Right? So that's putting the onus on us to say, hey, hold on. In spite of what I see, I will continue to rest on what God has said. I'm going to place my confidence in that. So, in spite of what I see on the news, I'm not going to walk in fear. Because what he said. Because if I can take up, if I can go to Norton Identity, Identity Theft Solutions or LifeLock and say, hey, you know, look at their contract and sign on the dotted line, believing that they are going to keep their word and spend my money out of my pocket to do that. How much more confidence should I have in the living God that has, that has declared that he desires to protect his children? All we have to do is say yes, amen, and receive it. Last 
last part of verse 4, he says, His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His truth. Now, if we, if you have an idea what shield is, there, there were different types of shields back in biblical times and medieval times back in the day. There was a type of shield that was probably as large as this podium is right, that men would use in war. Right? And when there's hand to hand combat going on, you got you know people shooting arrows, swinging swords, daggers. What the soldiers would do, they would have the big shield, but they also have a small one as well when people were close, right? Now, think about all of the, the things that are happening in the world, the, the dangers that are out here. And God says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, verse 5. Back in verse 4, he says, his truth will be your shield and buckler. His truth. So what is his truth? His truth is, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. His truth is, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the my almighty. He said it. That's his truth. So I use his truth to fortify my confidence in my safety. Not because of I'm so great or because I got, I may be packing or something like that. No, my safety is in what? My safety is in him. And if I place confidence in that truth, then that truth will, will surely be my shield and buckler to protect me from fear, from doubt, from unbelief. Verse 5 again, he says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Now I want us to pay specific attention to verse 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. This should be, I, I think it, all of us that watch the news should put a bookmark in Psalm 91 and keep it close to the TV. Because, you know, it, 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 there are a lot of things that are going on out here. And the danger is to get into fear. But remember what the Lord said. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. That's what the, that's what the psalmist said. Right? So if I allow, I allow his truth to be higher than anything that I see with my natural eyes, that truth is going to undergird my confidence. It is going to allow my heart to be at peace because I'm not I'm not going to be. shall not come near you. That has to be my confidence. That has to be yours. Only with your eyes you will see the reward of the wicked. Verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Now the psalmist is imploring those, the hearer, to make the decision that he made, to make the Lord your refuge. 
No evil shall befall you. No shall any plague come now your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up as you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample on your foot. Sounds like some awesome protection to me. Now, pay particular attention to these last three verses. Because this is in parentheses. This, this is the lowest response to the psalmist's confidence in God's protection. Okay. Verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Now, you believer, take verses 14, 15, 16. I dare you to take God as word. So to recap, three keys to spiritual identity theft protection. Know your worth, know your value, know your purpose, and know your refuge. Knowing these things are putting you in a position to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, through you, and for you everywhere you go. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the love that you continue to show each and every one of us. I thank you for the, the confidence that the psalmist wrote about your protection, about the surety of your protection, of your provision, Lord. But we need it every day. We need you every single day. So I declare over thee, the ears, the hearts, the minds of every hearer of this message. Holy Spirit, minister your word. Minister confidence in the reality of your love, the reality of your protection, your provision, the reality of who you are. Drawing men unto yourself. As I rebuke spirits of fear, may the spirit of faith arise. As your people seek your faith. And Lord, I give you praise, Lord. For all you've done for who you are. And all you have in store for days to come. Continue to keep our eyes on you, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you. And as we leave this place, but never your presence. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, your angelic host, be with us all. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen.